John chapter 7, we're going to begin at verse uh, 14, and we kind of parachute in the middle of one of these occasions where Jesus has traveled from Galilee to Jerusalem about the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. And he didn't go with everybody else. He didn't go with the other great companies of pilgrims that were traveling from Galilee to Jerusalem. He kind of went by himself. And he came not at the beginning of the feast time, but he came right in the middle of the feast time. And when he came, he came up to the temple to teach. That's what we're going to read starting at verse 14. But I just want you to picture it in your mind. Picture this vast piece of real estate known as the temple courts there in Jerusalem. Of course, right there in the middle is the actual temple. But then there's these vast courtyards around the temple built out of limestone and gleaming marble. And there's thousands of people gathered together there. Uh, People are getting ready for sacrifices. People are are, are, are speaking to the money changers, speaking but just associating. And there's Jesus there teaching on the Temple Mount. Verse 14, John chapter 7. Now about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up to the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying... How does this man know letters, having never studied? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. So do you have that picture in your mind? There's Jesus with great boldness. Oh, listen, he knows that the religious leaders have it out for him, but is he hiding away somewhere? No, he's in the most public place possible. He's right up there on the Temple Mount, and he's gathering a crowd to himself. Hey, everybody, listen to me as I teach. And he begins to teach them there in Jerusalem, much the same as he's been teaching in Galilee. He's brought his teaching to the very Temple Mount, and he speaks with boldness. He he speaks with wisdom and authority and insight, so much so that the religious leaders, when they hear this, they're dumbfounded. Their jaws drop just a little bit. And verse 15 says that they said, how does this man know letters having never studied? Now, please, friends, I think the translation there in the New King James isn't so great. Because the idea isn't, oh, I guess this man's not illiterate. That's kind of what you would gather. He knows letters. He knows his reading and writing. It's not just that. The idea in the original language is, is, How does he know the scriptures so well? That's what they're referring to. They look at Jesus and they say, this man is a master of the Bible. He knows the scriptures forwards and backwards. He just doesn't just know the text. He understands it and can explain it and can interpret it. He doesn't need to refer to rabbi so-and-so and and scholar this and that. Man, he knows the scriptures himself. How does he have this learning? Because this is what they knew about Jesus. Jesus. He didn't follow the normal educational track for a Jewish teacher. You know, in those days, there was a whole system by which a person became a teacher in Judaism. You attached yourself to a rabbi, and that rabbi guided you through a many-year term of learning. It was sort of a uh, seminary by apprenticeship. And Jesus had much the same kind of program with his own disciples. You see, Jesus had his disciples... But by whom was Jesus discipled? There was no man that discipled Jesus. And this is what blew their minds. He didn't come through a normal seminary education system. He didn't do this. How does this man know all these things? Now, there's a couple things that speaks to me about this right here. If, even if we want to stop at verse 15. The two thing, few things that speak to me are this. Number one, it shows that they had nothing to criticize Jesus about when it came to his teaching. If they could have criticized the content of his teaching, don't you think they would have done it? But there was nothing to criticize in the content of his teaching. So what did they criticize? They tried to criticize the credentials of the man teaching. When you can't find any fault in what the man is teaching, then you try to criticize the man himself. And that's exactly what they tried to do. That's number one. Number two, it shows us that Jesus replied to them in verse 16 and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. Jesus didn't point to his credentials, but to his doctrine. It's as if he said something like this. I don't have a seminary degree, but listen, judge me by my doctrine. If you can find a place where I'm not interpreting the scriptures correctly, 
If you can find a place where I'm being dishonest in dealing with the word of God, then bring it on. But if you listen carefully to the doctrine of Jesus, they would know that it was all rooted in Old Testament scriptures and that it was from God. Friends, there's something very valuable in that. Listen, Jesus is showing us something here that even though he didn't come up through the educational system of his day, he was an educated man. And he was a man taught, not self-taught, but God taught because he knew the scriptures. Now this kind of speaks to me in my own life because I don't know, you know, I don't, I don't talk a whole lot about myself and my own history and my own background, but I'll just lay my cards out here on the table. I have no formal biblical education. I don't. Well, I take it back. I went to a Bible school where, praise God, I met my blessed wife, you know, some 35 years ago, whatever whatever it was exactly. I went to a Bible school that lasted three months. That's all the program was. It's not like I dropped out or quit or anything. (laughs) So I I have three months of kind of a semi-formal Bible education. But even that wasn't like a high-powered Bible college. They didn't even call it Bible college. They called it Bible school. But beyond that, I don't have any formal seminary training, Bible college training. Um, I I do have a bachelor's degree from UCSB in history. Go Gauchos. (laughs) But you know that, now, I, I don't say that to say, oh, if you're really spiritual, you don't need to go to those book learning schools or anything like that. Friends, that's not it at all. Listen, God places no value on an ignorant ministry. People who are going to serve God and teach his word, they should be educated. But I think that what Jesus shows us and what other passages in the Bible told us, show us is that there's more than one way to be an educated minister. And God can teach a person several different ways. Can God use a Bible college or a seminary to train and raise up a minister? Absolutely he can, and he often does. But can God use other ways as well? Yes, he can. The most important thing is just to say, I feel a little self-conscious talking about myself in this regard, but just to say, can that man handle the scriptures? Does he know the word of God? Can he rightly divide it? In this sense, the evidence is right there. You can either see it or not. And if he can't do it, I don't care how many diplomas are on his wall. He's not qualified. If he can do it, then maybe God has taught him in an unorthodox way. Education is great. It can be wonderfully used of God. But the result has to be someone who knows God's truth according to the Bible. And who is sent by God. Jesus was not man-taught or self-taught. He was God-taught. He wasn't man-sent or self-sent. Jesus was God-sent. Now he continues on in verse 17. If anyone wants to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. Now what Jesus is saying there to the, the, the crowd and to the religious leaders is, if you guys were obedient to God, if you would do God's will then you'd have a better understanding of doctrine. And friends, there's a very important principle there, a very important principle. If you want to know God's will, pursue obedience to God in your life. There are some people for whom the most dramatic breakthrough you could ever experience in your own study of God's word and your own understanding of true doctrine, the most uh, significant breakthrough you'll ever experience is rooted to this. Why don't you start obeying God? God's called you to obedience in a certain part of your life. And if you're blatantly disobeying God, if you're just kind of saying, well, let's just forget about that one, God. I'll do my own thing and hope you look the other way then how can you say you can really understand biblical truth when you're locked into disobedience? It shows us that understanding the things of God is not merely an intellectual thing. It's not merely a thing of learning in a class or being taught by a great teacher. There is a spiritual aspect to it, and because there is a spiritual aspect to it, it is connected to obedience. 
But now he continues on, verse 18. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Now, you know who Jesus is speaking about. He's speaking about himself. He who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true. Who's the one who seeks the glory of God here? It's Jesus, and he is true. And look at this phrase at the end of verse 18, friends. There is no unrighteousness in him. Do you understand what Jesus just said about himself in verse 18? Number one, he said, I seek the glory of God. Number two, he said, I am true. And number three, he said this, there is no unrighteousness in me. Could you imagine saying that to a public crowd with enemies in your midst? I'm sinless. Jesus said it publicly. What an audacious thing for any man to say. But friends, in the case of Jesus Christ, It was true. He is and was sinless. And so much so that he could say it before a public crowd of people who opposed him. Now continuing on in verse 19, he says this. Did not Moses give you the law and yet none of you keeps the law? Why do you seek to kill me? The people answered and said, you have a demon. Who's seeking to kill you? Jesus answered and said to them, I did one work and you all marvel. Moses therefore gave you circumcision, that is, not from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Now, Jesus had just said something pretty dramatic in verse 18. In verse 18, he said, I am sinless. There is no unrighteousness in me. But now he looks to the people who oppose him in verse 19. And he says, how about you guys? None of you keep the law. I keep the law, but you don't. And in contrast to Jesus, they were law breakers, not law keepers. Matter of fact, they wanted to break the law in that they wanted to kill Jesus. Now, when he said that, the public said, verse 20, you have a demon who's seeking to kill you. It was not popularly known amongst that crowd that the religious leaders wanted to kill him. But we know that the religious leaders did. They wanted to kill him way back in John chapter 5 because of what Jesus did in healing the man at the pool of Bethesda. But there in verse 23, Jesus says, makes a little analogy. You guys got all worked up about me about the Sabbath because I healed a man and told him to pick up his bed and walk on the Sabbath. And you're criticizing me because of that. Jesus says, hey, if a child is circumcised on the Sabbath, you say that's great. You know, according to the law of Moses, it's in the book of Leviticus, that a boy should be circumcised on the eighth day. And if that eighth day fell on the Sabbath, they went ahead and circumcised the child, which is a work. Jesus said it's okay to circumcise a child on the Sabbath, and that's hurting somebody. I mean, look, even a circumcision is obedient. It's painful, at least for the child. Jesus says, it's okay to hurt somebody on the Sabbath, but it's not okay to heal somebody on the Sabbath? What kind of thinking is that? It's just a brilliant analysis by Jesus in that regard. But look at what he says in verse 24. He says, do not judge according to appearance but a judge with righteous judgment. You see, they decided that Jesus appeared to be a sinner and they appeared to be righteous, but they were wrong on both counts and they needed to judge with righteous judgment instead, instead of judging only by appearances. Friends, have you ever seen it on a statue or maybe a depiction where they depict justice as a woman with scales in her hand? And when justice is that woman with scales on her hands, what does she have on her head? A blindfold. Why? Because justice is not supposed to judge according to appearances. It's not supposed to say, oh, well, this person is rich. He must be right. Oh, this person is poor. They must be right. This person is this class. They must be right. This person, another class. They must be right. No, no. You're supposed to throw all of that out and judge according to truth and righteousness, not according to appearance. And that's exactly what Jesus is speaking about. Now, the conversation on the Temple Mount goes on in verse 25. It says, now some of them from Jerusalem said, is this not he whom they seek to kill? But look, he speaks boldly and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know that this is truly the Christ? 
The people of Jerusalem, when they saw Jesus speaking so boldly there on the Temple Mount, and when they saw that the religious authorities could not shut him down, they say, maybe even the religious authorities know he is the Messiah. Maybe they understand that. Maybe that's why they're not shutting him up. The rulers wanted to shut Jesus up, but they couldn't do it. Now look at the reply in verse 27. However, this is the crowd speaking, we know where this man is from, but when the Christ comes, no one knows where he is from. Friends, it's a very interesting thing that in that day, many, now please understand, I said many, not all, many Jews at that time believed something curious about the Messiah. They believed that when the Messiah appeared, he would come as a complete surprise. They based this on passages such as Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, where it talks about God's messenger coming to the temple suddenly. And they said, when the Messiah comes, nobody's going to know where he comes from. Nobody's going to know anything about his history. But he's instantly going to burst upon the world as the Messiah coming to the world. Now what's interesting about it is that is true. But it's true of the second coming of the Messiah. They didn't understand that in the first coming of the Messiah, it was clearly prophesied that he would come from Bethlehem. That there would be no mystery where he comes from. And Jesus says, or excuse me, the crowd simply says, now we know where this man comes from. This man comes from from, uh, uh, um, uh, Nazareth, I should say. He comes from Bethlehem. But listen, we don't know, or we think that the Christ is going to come suddenly. And then Jesus replies, verse 28, then Jesus cried out as he taught in the temple saying, you both know me and you know where I'm from and have not come of myself. But he who sent me is true, whom you do not know, but I know him, for I am from him, and he sent me. You know, the first sentence of Jesus' reply here may very well have been sarcastic. Oh, you think you know me, do you? Well, you really don't know me at all. Because, as he goes on to explain, especially in verse 29, he says, I am from him, and he sent me. Jesus says, you think you know all about me? You look at him and say, oh, he's from Bethlehem. That's where he was born. Oh, oh, he's from Nazareth. That's where he grew up. Oh, we know all about you, Jesus. You don't know me at all, Jesus says. I'll tell you something. I am from him. Who's the him? God the Father in heaven. And he sent me. I come on his authority, not upon my own. Now, friends, Jesus knew exactly who he was and where he came from. Have you ever wondered this about kind of the interior life of Jesus? Some people wonder if Jesus wasn't confused. Am I the Messiah or not? I don't really know. Um, Am I the son of God in a special way or not? I don't really know. I'm trying to figure it out. Sometimes I feel like I am. Sometimes I feel like I'm not. Now listen, I, I, I don't know how Jesus came to all of that awareness in himself. I don't know when he came to that awareness. But I'll tell you what, the Jesus in his years of ministry on this earth, the Jesus of John chapter 7, he's not confused at all. He knows exactly who he is. He knew exactly who sent him. He knew exactly where he came from. He speaks clearly without any confusion. I came from heaven. God sent me in a way unlike anyone else who has ever walked this earth. Well, well, I thought God sent Isaiah the prophet. Yeah, he sent Isaiah the prophet, but not like he sent me. I thought God sent Elijah. Oh yeah, God sent Elijah, but not like he sent me. Because God sent Elijah and Isaiah from earth. God sent me from heaven. And I have a relationship with him that nobody else does. I want you to think about this. Jesus, in verse 28, he cried out when he said this. He shouted it to the whole temple mount. I come from heaven. God uniquely sent me. I know who I am and where I came from. Let me just mention a brief side point right here. I want to apply it to us. You know, there's a lot of people who wonder that in life. Man, who am I? 
Where did I come from? Where am I going? And listen, you got your birth certificate. It's not like you didn't know which hospital you were born in. But there's something even more core to your identity. You, you know, back uh, in the 70s, they used to call, I'm searching for myself. I'm trying to find myself. Do you remember that stuff? Well, friends, that same impulse is in people today, even if they don't talk about it. So they're trying to find themselves. They're trying to find themselves by associating themselves with a career. That's my identity, who I am. They're trying to find themselves by associating them with a product. Man, I'm an I'm a, I'm a iPhone person or I'm an Android person. That's who I am. They, they try to find it by associating themselves with some cultural trend. You know, oh man, I'm the one who's really into coffee. And I'll tell you all the nuances and all that. Listen, you can have your interests and your hobbies. You can have your smartphone preferences. You know, all that stuff is all pretty minor. But let me tell you something. If you really want to know who you are, if you really want to know why you exist on this earth, it's not going to happen by gazing at your own navel. It's going to happen. It's going to... Can you really do that? That's just, that's just an expression, isn't it? Believe that's not even in my notes. It just came spontaneously. It's not going to happen by looking into yourself. It's going to happen as you put your eyes on Jesus Christ. Well, well, why don't you just leave this great voyage of self-discovery? Why don't you just leave that for later? Focus on Jesus Christ. You're going to find who you are and your purpose in life by having a focus and a diligent attention on Jesus himself, not by focusing on yourself. You know what? Jesus was more confident in where he came from, who he was, and where he was going than any man who ever walked this earth. And it's as you unite yourself with him that those things will be clear for you in your life. You don't have to be troubled by this. You don't have to spend sleepless nights. Why am I here? What am I here for? Put your focus on Jesus. And as much as you need to know of that, in time, in place, he will reveal that to you. But the secret is putting your focus upon Jesus. Now there's Jesus on the Temple Mount teaching so boldly, so amazingly clear about himself. He's just proclaiming on the whole Temple Mount that he's God. Isn't that what he's saying? I'm sinless. I'm sent from heaven. I have a special relationship with my father. He's proclaiming that he's God on the very temple mount. That doesn't make the religious leaders happy. Look at verse 30. Therefore they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. You know, when Jesus so clearly claimed to be God, it must have driven those religious leaders crazy. He can't say that. He can't say it here on the Temple Mount. We got to shut this man up. We got to stop it all immediately. And so they commanded for the officers of the temple court to come and arrest Jesus. Stop him. Shut him up. But look at what happens. Verse 30, no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Do you realize that? That until the time was right, no one could lay a hand on Jesus. Oh, they could try. They could send out a SWAT team against him on the Temple Mount. It's going nowhere. Not until it was the Father's time. And friends, by our best calculations, this is only about six months before the Passover where Jesus would be crucified. It wasn't that far from the right time but it was not yet the right time. There would come a time when Jesus will later say, my hour has come, about six months from this time in John chapter 7, but that hour had not yet come. You know, those arresting officers, they wanted to take him, but they couldn't. It just wouldn't happen. Later on, and we're going to see this next week when we study the rest of John chapter 7, later on when the officers returned to the religious leaders, when they returned to the religious leaders empty-handed because they didn't arrest Jesus, th- this is what they said. They said uh, to their bosses, their bosses went, no, where's Jesus? How come you didn't arrest him? This is what they say. No man ever spoke like this man. You, you know, we wanted to arrest him, but we just couldn't. You should hear the guy speak. And the religious leader says, that's the problem. We don't want him to speak. 
But look at the good result in verse 31. And many of the people believed in him. And they said, when the Christ comes, will he do more signs than these which this man has done? I, I like their thinking. They're saying, look, is the Messiah really going to do more miracles than this guy's has done? Maybe he really is. They're believing on him. Jesus is proclaiming himself. Jesus is being set forward, and people are believing upon him. Friends, in some ways, that's all what we want to be about as a church. It's just exalting Jesus and setting him forward, and people will believe on him. They will. If we exalt Jesus, if we put him front and center, he will draw people unto himself. And that's all we're just called to do. And that's what Jesus was doing right then on the Temple Mount. Now, pick it up at verse 32. The Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things concerning him. And the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Then Jesus said to them, I shall be with you a little while longer, and then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and not find me, and where I am you cannot come. Then the Jews said amongst themselves, where does he intend to go that we shall not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What is this thing which he said, you will seek me and not find me, and where I am you cannot come? They were confused by what Jesus said, but they were captivated by it by the same time. Jesus just simply said to them, uh, verse 33, I shall be with you a little while longer. Listen, arresting officers, not now. L later, I'll go with you. About six months from now, Jesus looks at the, you know, his day planner or whatever it is. I I'll look at my schedule. It looks to me like it's going to be about six months from now. I'll go with you then, but not now. The hour's not right. I'll be with you a little while longer but I'm not going with you anywhere by force. Forget about arresting me. I'll stay as long as my father directs, but I won't be dragged anywhere outside of my father's will. You know, friends, isn't it a wonderful thing for us to know that other people are not the lords of our life? Those arresting officers didn't have authority over Jesus those religious leaders didn't have authority over Jesus who had authority over Jesus his father in heaven and nothing was going to happen until his father in heaven willed it you know some of you suffer under some pretty difficult people I, I don't know who it might be maybe it's a parent maybe it's a boss maybe it's a neighbor maybe it's a family member I don't know but you suffer under difficult people and you sort of, you're sort of pained at the idea that they hold your life in their hand. Can I just tell you, in the name of Jesus, if you're a child of God, if you belong to him, it's not true. Your life is hidden in the hand of Jesus. And I know sometimes it feels that this person has authority of, oh, they can do whatever they please and they must run my life. They don't. God in heaven is the master and the Lord of your life. And you got to believe that nothing can come to you except it fat passes through the Father's hands and the Father's wisdom first. You can take a little encouragement from that, can't you? You can just say to yourself, they're not the Lord of my life. Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life. And have that confidence before God. Jesus ended this little discourse by saying, verse 28, or excuse me, verse 36, you'll seek me and not find me. You, you see, they were troubled by this statement. But Jesus is saying, if you seek me with a hostile examination, if you seek me for the purpose of rejecting me or arresting me or silencing me or killing me, it's not going to happen. You're not going to find me. Because my life is hid in my Father in heaven. I feel a little bad this morning because we have to cut it right here, right in the middle of Jesus' great speech on the Temple Mount right there uh, during the Feast of Tabernacles. And when we continue our text next week, man, it's the most glorious section of this whole speech. It's even better than what we just studied right now. Uh, really, I mean, I don't say that to bum me out, but really, if you were going to miss this week or next week, this was the week to miss. <laughs> you, you, you really got to get it next week. 
because how Jesus concludes this speech, well, I mean, you can read ahead for yourself and you get excited about us talking about it next Sunday. But I just want to come back to one thing and we'll wrap up with this. Look at verse 31 again. You see, the people of Jerusalem asked a very logical question. They asked this question. When the Christ comes, will he do more signs than these which this man has done? I think that's a very logical question. They're looking at Jesus and they're thinking of all the miracles that he did. Man, he raised the dead. He gave sight to the blind. He gave hearing to the deaf. He made paralyzed men walk. He stilled the storm with a word. He fed 5,000 with a few loaves and fishes. Are we really expecting a Messiah to do more than this man has done? Isn't that a great logical question? But you know, it's funny. People need to think that way about Jesus today. It's a very fair question to ask. Who has done more than Jesus? All right, let's just say theoretically that Jesus is not the Messiah. Let's say that theoretically. I I believe with all my heart that he is. That he's God the Son, that he's the Son of God, that he's the Messiah of God. I believe that with all my heart. But just theoretically, let's say that he's not. Then what would we expect from another Messiah, the Messiah who really does come? What would we expect? If Jesus isn't the guy, then what would we expect from the guy who really is the Messiah? When that so-called true Messiah comes, what do you expect from him? Do you really expect that he's going to do more miracles than Jesus? That he's going to teach with more insight and authority than Jesus? Do you expect him to love more remarkably than Jesus? Do you expect him to suffer with more courage than Jesus? Do you expect him to atone for more sinners than Jesus? Do you expect him to rise from the dead with more triumph from Jesus than Jesus did? Do you expect him to ascend to heaven in greater glory than Jesus did? Do do you expect him to present a greater gospel than Jesus has? Do you expect him to change more lives than Jesus has? Do, Do you expect him to free more people from addictions than Jesus has? Do you expect him to comfort more grief stricken people than Jesus has? Do you expect him to heal more broken hearts than Jesus has? Do you expect him to restore more marriages? To triumph over more tyrants? Do you expect him to gain more followers than Jesus? When you think about it that way, you think, no way. No one could ever do more in this world than Jesus has done, is doing, and will do. Because he is the Messiah of God. Put your trust in him. Amen. And I just love that line of thinking. Look, if this isn't the guy, what possibly would we expect from the one who really is? No, he is. He is the Messiah of God, and today we put our trust in him. And friends, let me just leave you with this encouraging word. What he has done for others, he will do for you. Jesus hasn't done all those miraculous, wonderful things to leave you aside. He loves you. He cares for your need. And he wants to speak to it right now in your life.